spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered in the cloud. Verse 34 says, while he yet spake in Luke 9. That meant that God was so adamant about shutting down this bright idea of Peter. That while he was speaking, God interrupted him. Peter voiced about building three tabernacles. The Bible says in verse 33 that he did not know what he said. You see that in Luke 9, 33. Peter submits an idea, voices this idea. It's apparent that this idea was counterintuitive to what God was intending what, when God summons his son up to the mountain and that Christ was transfigured. What Peter said stood opposed to the, to the culture and the ebb and the flow of the kingdom. The kingdom is in motion. God is in motion. God's work is in motion. What Peter wanted to do was very dangerous. He was about to submit an idea that would establish a dangerous habit and a dangerous precedent that God said, I couldn't, cannot allow those who were be foundation layers in this kingdom. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And I cannot have the, the foundation being laid by those who would seek to build tabernacles where I was. Let me say that again. I cannot have the foundation being laid by those who would seek to build tabernacles where I was. This, this idea was though a good idea on the surface. It was a dangerous idea. That's why verse 33 says he didn't know what he was saying. And while he was speaking, you see that in Luke 9 and 34, while he was speaking, Look at Matthew 17 in verse five, while he yet spake. What is that saying collectively? It's saying that God was so adamant, shutting down Peter's idea, interrupting Peter's idea, his, his, his words, stopping him mid-sentence. Essentially, look at this in verse five of Matthew 17. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Don't continue with that notion. Because if you start this, you will, you will start a dangerous precedent and a very bad habit that will be detrimental to the body of Christ that will undermine the move of God. And that is, don't build tabernacles because if you do, you will make this the mountain of transfiguration. And you will come here repeatedly, yearly, annually. You will commemorate and celebrate what I did. You'll come up to this mountain and you'll memorialize a move. And you'll continue to come here believing that my move happens here. Woman, the hour comes. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. This comes out of that same mindset. The kingdom mandate is that we don't tabernacle where he was. Do not erect monuments and tabernacles and buildings and structures to repeat, replay, to reenact, to revisit a move of God. And that's why we took the time to plant here, to tell you, to show you that God was so adamant about shutting down this notion, about dis debunking this, motion, this notion God says, you're not going to do it. I'm not going to have my church built upon the, uh, by prophets and apostles who think, who have a mindset of building tabernacles to memorialize a move, to denominationalize what God did. Because God is a God in motion, which is why I showed you, we gave you 1 Kings chapter 19 with Elijah, not coincidental, not coincidentally, it is that same Elisha that appears here in this mountain. This is so good because there's some powerful revelation. We saw this. Let's 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 deal with this. God moved through the wind, but he wasn't in the wind. I ask you to highlight that in first Kings 19, beginning at verse 11. He moved in the earthquake, but he was not in the earthquake. He moved through the fire, but he was not in the fire. And afterwards, a still small voice. You saw the, the move of God. God was in motion. God is a God in motion, but the Bible says where he was was not where he actually is. 
He was in the earthquake. He was in the wind. He was in the fire. He was in the still small voice. We have to move. The same pension. God wants to, to, he wants to, to end at that moment. God wanted to shut down the very notion. Moses, show me your glory. God says, I'm going to pass by, pass by. We saw God in motion. God is a God in motion. So hence his word holds his same characteristics. His word, his voice speaks words that are always in motion. I want you to write that down. Since in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God then that means his words hold his same characteristics as God is a God in motion. Thus, his words are in motion. His words are moving. Don't tabernacle where he was because you'll miss where he is. The greatest enemy to the next move of God, arguably, is not the devil. But I believe the greatest enemy to the next move of God is the last move of God. You, we are where he was, but we're not where he is. And we're seeing the proverbial struggle from Old Testament to New Testament. This is good. Moses and Elisha in the mountain, three tabernacles, while Peter spake, submitting this idea, voicing this idea, while he was speaking, God came and disrupted it, shut the idea down. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's why you have Moses who embodies and represents the apostle. He is a, he is a representation of the apostle in the Old Testament. Elisha, who is an Old Testament prophet, he represents the prophets of the New Testament. That's why they're there with Christ. They represent. We are now dealing with the eternal kingdom, the picture of the eternal kingdom, the picture of the church. Peter, James, and John, Christ being glorified. Christ being glorified. But God shutting down the notion that you have to build three tabernacles. He says the church is a body of people on the move. God's word is on the move. God's voice travels. His word moves. Turn quickly to the book of Genesis chapter three. I want you to see the precedent that God establishes in verse number eight. You turn with me the first book, the book of Genesis. The book of origins, verse number eight. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. The first thing we must observe, extract and explore is that the voice of the Lord God is walking. The omnipresent Elohim who surrounds us speaks in surround sound. His voice is omnipresent. He's moving. I've seen legs walk, but I've never heard of a voice walking. He says the sound of God was traversing back and forth. This is powerful. The language of verse eight, the voice of the Lord God walking, the sound of God. God moves in omni sound. It's much more than just vibrations. The word that goes forth out of God's mouth does that. It doesn't just, his words aren't just spoken, but his words proceed out. They go without his words and move. Man, should I live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth. It's the present tense. Not proceeded, but proceeds that continues. His word continues. Genesis 3 and 8 should be tantamized with Isaiah 55 and 11. Isaiah 55 and 11, to me, is so much akin to Genesis 3 and 8. As a matter of fact, when you read Genesis 3 and 8, and when you interpolate Isaiah 55 and 11, it says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Do you see that? It, his word, shall not return unto me void or empty. Let me read that again. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. God's word is not just spoken. It's not just words spoken. Hebrews 11 and 3 says that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The things which are not seen are not made from things which do appear. 
The things which are seen are not made from things which do appear. The things which are seen are not made from things which do appear. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The things which are seen, they're not made from things which do appear. And because God's word forms and frames worlds, that means that the worlds hold all creation hold the same characteristics and attributes of the word. That's why nature is always in motion. That's why he creates an earth that's in motion. That's why he creates a solar system that's always in motion, orbiting the earth, rotating and revolving. Nature is always moving. Your body is always moving, even when you're dormant, even when you're stationary, the body is always moving, constantly aging, cells are dividing. God makes everything as an extension of himself, as a reflection, a mirror reflection of himself, because his, wor because his words formed and framed worlds. That means that every word spoken that creates creative power is in his word. It, creative power is in his words. And watch this, the creation that comes out of the creative word holds the same characteristics of the creator. And since the creator is always in motion, that his word is always in motion, his voice, walks his so too is my word that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return you see the word being active not stagnant not dormant not stationary not static it shall not return unto me void or empty notice look at what the word is doing powerful but it shall accomplish that which i please and it his word shall prosper in the thing whereto i sent it don't confuse god's words with ours we speak mindlessly we speak Impulsively. God is not like that. God is premeditated. His words come out of a thought. God is a thinking God. God premeditates. He thinks. He thinks it through. He plans it. Before he speaks it, he plans it. Before it comes out of his mouth, it first gestates in his mind. The reason why God can do all things is because he knows all things. It is out of his omniscience that his mouth speaks. And it is from there then that God reveals that he is a God in motion. So we see in Genesis 3 and 8, God is a God in motion. He is always progressing. Revelation is progressive. And then when we get to the book of uh, Exodus chapter 33, my glory passes by. We see God moving. Exodus chapter 33, God is in motion beginning at verse 18 through 23. Moses says, show me your glory. God is speaking of as I'm going to make my my glory pass by you. God is always in motion. Genesis 3 and 8, God is in motion. Isaiah 55 and 11, his word goeth forth, return, accomplishes, prosper. It's not empty. He watches over his word to perform it. Movement. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God uh, moved, was hovering over the face of the water, moved over the face of the waters. And, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. You see the activity, the activity of, of the eternal kingdom, the activity of God, the activity of a word that goes forth, the activity of the Holy Spirit constantly moving back and forth, hovering over the face of the waters, moving over the face of the waters. In Genesis 3 and 8, the voice of God, the omnipresent one, is speaking with an omni sound. The one who surrounds us speaks in surround sound. His words echo, they reverberate. They move here and they move there, but they don't do so haphazardly. They don't, they don't do so without order. God is a God of order. His words move. He Exodus 33 passes by movement. First Kings chapter 19 movement. He moved. He was once in the wind, but no longer. This is good. He was once in the earthquake, but no longer. He was once in the fire, but no longer in a still small voice. No longer. Let's build three tabernacles because now this is what you're going to do. You're going to try to keep him in the wind. You're going to go to the place where he was in the wind. You want a tabernacle with God in the wind. And you wind up being where he was, but he wasn't in the wind. Let's build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. God, while Peter was submitting his idea, God came immediately and abruptly and interrupted Peter's idea. Because Peter's idea stood 
antithetical to the move of the kingdom. God, write this down. I pray you're getting this. This is good. Don't do it. On the surface, it's a, it's a good idea, but every good idea is not a God one. Let me say that again. Every good idea is not a God idea. Just because it sounds good doesn't mean it's profitable to the kingdom. And except the idea is God induced, God breathed, God inspired, then the church cannot use it. The road to this way is paved with good ideas. No wonder it's so, it's so counterintuitive and it becomes stumbling blocks because we are camped around where God was. He's not in the wind. He's not in the earthquake. Don't tabernacle where he was in the earthquake. If you build a tabernacle right there where God was in the earthquake, you'll discover, Elijah, that God was not in the earthquake. So you will build a tabernacle where he was in the earthquake. You will go to the place where he was in the earthquake. You will commemorate his move at the, when he was in the earthquake, looking for him to be there. And you'll find yourself in just doing it arbitrarily, just doing it customarily. And it's void and it's empty. You'll go to the fire where he was and you'll build a tabernacle where he was in the fire. But the Bible says he was not in the fire. I pray you're getting this. You're seeing a dangerous pattern. And do you understand that that's vain religion today? That's what's happening today. Building a monument and building tabernacles around a move of God that we're missing God's move. We are where he was, but we're not where he is. And this is all going to make sense in the moment because you got Moses and you have Elijah. Now, I have you in Matthew 17 because this is huge. We're about to go deeper. Matthew chapter 17 and Luke chapter 9 presents Moses and Elijah. Again, I ask you to write that down. I ask you to highlight Moses and Elijah. Out of all Old Testament figures, why Moses and Elijah? I want to camp here.